Hello, and thanks for tuning in to a previously recorded webinar. This webinar is brought to you by the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. I'm Billy Thomas, the host for the Forestry Webinar Series. After viewing this webinar, if you have any questions, please email us at forestry.extension at uky.edu and we will respond to your questions. Thanks again for watching this recorded webinar and please enjoy. Hello and welcome to the UK Forestry Webinar Series. I'm Billy Thomas, an Extension Forester here at the Department of Forestry, and we're going to be turning it over in just a couple minutes to Dr. Matt Springer. Um, Matt, glad to have you with us tonight. We're going to be talking about deer management, you know, and um, we're in the middle of deer season right we now. We are, yes. Yeah, it's an appropriate time to have it. Unfortunately, some of the things I'm going to talk about we probably needed a couple weeks ago, but, uh, you know, there's always next year, right? Yeah, we can no. implement things, but yeah, big, big time of year and you know, a lot of hunters have been in the woods and are still potentially in the woods. Yeah. So this is a topic that we hear so much about, you know, being a forester, I, I want to do anything I can to encourage and promote forest management. And we have found that wildlife is a great tool to kind of do that. So, um, Matt, I'm so excited to have you talking about this really important topic. You know, deer is a big thing here in Kentucky. It really is. Deer so, is uh, a big thing in Kentucky. <laughs> You're a top five Boone and Crockett state and gets a lot of attention nationally. Oh, wow. You know, and I know there's been a lot of interest. And like you said, nationally, a lot of people wanting to come in and hunt here in Kentucky. So we're kind of attractive for that. Oh, well, we have a lot of people coming from a long ways away. Um, you know, some folks, you can just drive around to some of the local WM wildlife management areas or Daniel Blue National Forest and you'll see license plates from Texas, Georgia, Florida, yeah. and all the above. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting stuff. It really is. And big dynamics for our landowners as well as our deer population. So without any further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and turn this presentation over to Dr. Matt Springer. Again, Matt, so glad to have you with us. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise. And folks, just put your questions in the chat pod and we'll address them as we go. All right, Matt, show's yours. Thank you. All right, so what the goal of this presentation um, is really to give an introduction to the how-tos for wild or for deer management specifically, um, it's you know there's there's a lot of classes that cover this. Uh, the Quality Deer Management Association has week-long events uh, that build up, and over time, there's a lot of education materials that are shared. So this is you know the way I'm approaching this is this is the the bottom, the basics, and you can build from here. And with that being the basics, there's a lot of topics to cover. Um, so what are we really going to cover? Well, I want to give you an introduction of white-tailed deer, the history of, uh, around the management of, of white-tailed deer, because it's quite the conservation success story. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the basic deer management principles and how they affect your actual herd management uh, and what you should pay attention to and what's reasonable to, to, to look at and do versus what really you're not going to be able to, to uh, influence your herd as much. Uh, harvest management, some of the strategies and the misnomers. Um, we want to make sure that you know you're you're knowledgeable about your deer herd health because that's going to drive a lot of your management decisions. So, what data is important to collect, and how are we going to do that? How then do you apply the collected data, making sense of everything that you're bringing in? Um, your different herd management options, um, and then also because um, it's been a big EHD year in a lot of parts of our state here, I want to cover some of the big deer diseases so you're a little aware of them. Uh, so you can kind of, uh, if you see something uh, funky in a deer that's harvested or hit hit by a car, you may be able to identify one of these diseases that um, you know is very important to the management of the, of the herd in the state. So a history of of, of white-tailed deer um, pre-settlement, pre-European pre settlement uh, in the United States, we had a population of about 14 million deer. Um, at the turn of the century here, um, unfortunately, because of uh, over harvest. Um, habitat loss, about 18, uh, you know, we, we dropped down to almost a half million animals nationwide. Uh, a lot of that had to do with market hunting. Um, in 1850, a deer would be loaded onto a train from a rural area, shipped to one of the big cities. It would sell for about a dollar. And at that point in time, you know, that's, that's a large income for, for a lot of folks. Um, with the implementation of uh, limited harvest, um, an actual 
application of, of uh, hunting regulations with people to enforce them, uh, the, the population began to grow. Uh, and now we're at almost 30 million deer nationwide and growing. Uh, within the state of Kentucky, we're actually somewhere around about 900,000 uh, deer, and that's up from almost 2,000 animals in 1945. And most recently in 1990, we basically doubled our population in the last 25 years. Uh, our city, you know, went up from 400,000 individuals in 1990 to what almost is a million now. Uh, it's quite the conservation success story. Um, and along with that growing population, the, the hunters have been harvesting record numbers of deer, especially in the last five years within the state. Uh, we're right about 140,000 deer a year uh, in Kentucky over the last about five years, uh, which is a you know, cons consistent high harvest uh, historically for our state. Now, there's really five major principles in deer management. Uh, they are age, nutrition, genetics, sex ratio or population level, and the land area which you're managing for. Now these are really big groups, um, and for a lot of folks, what we're concerned about, um, if it's you know simply deer management for populations, then this really doesn't influence a lot other than just how many deer are in an area. However, a lot of folks are interested in, in trying to harvest larger deer or healthier deer. Um, and that really brings three big ones into play here where they're directly influencing larger antlers, antlers and healthier deer. And they're in order of importance uh, related to larger antlers is age, nutrition, and then finally genetics. But number one and number two are the biggest drivers of large antlers and deer uh, across the, their, their range. And indirectly, the sex ratio and population level actually uh, comes into play because if you have a population level or a sex ratio that's not in line with what the land can support, that will affect the, the animal's nutrition within an area and also potentially their age. Uh, so that all indirectly affects uh, antler size and deer herd health. So let's get into these principles. The first one being age, and as I said, it's the most important uh, in terms of antler size and deer and in a population where you hunt. Um, the largest antlers of a white-tailed deer are usually uh, realized in between four and a half to seven and a half years of age. Uh, and they can very dra drastically grow, especially from two and a half, three and a half to four and a half. Um, Deer antlers at one and a half years old um, really are kind of related to when that animal was born the previous year and how much new time it had to get nutrition. After one and a half years old, that animal kind of has been able to recover from when it was born. So fawns that were born late generally have spikes or forks uh, relative to fawns that are born earlier, which may have four or six points. Um, so after a year and a half, though, those deer are able to kind of catch up and they look a little bit more... Um, consistent with the deer that are born either earlier or later uh, at two and a half years of age. But the biggest thing here is if you want bigger antlered bucks on, uh, to be harvested where you are hunting, um, the best thing you can do is, is make sure that those deer are getting to three and a half, four and a half or older in age. Uh, let those yearlings and two and a half year olds survive because there's a really large jump in antler size between two and a half to three and a half and even a bigger jump between three and a half and four. Um, there's a, you know, the image at the bottom here is taken from Quality Deer Management Association and that's, you know, it simply, sh it shows very simply how much an antler will change just by the age of the deer, not taking into account nutrition or genetics, just let the deer get older and you'll get substantially larger antlers. Now, nutrition is the other really large um, impact factor when it comes to how big of an antler you can have. Um, it's de deer nutrition and deer herd health are, are very closely entwined. If you don't have healthy individuals, you will not have large antlers. You won't have healthy fawns. Um, they just will be food stress and not able to reach their, their potential. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that deer eat a lot of food. Um, somewhere between four to six pounds of browse a day per hundred pounds of body weight. That means a, a larger older buck may eat as much as 12 to 15 pounds of food each day. So you have to have a lot of food on the landscape to support these animals. Um, and that, you know, the ability to get food and the right amount of food directly influences their body size and their antler development. Um, 
you know, throughout the year. If they can't get food in the winter, it's going to impact whether or not the uh, deer comes out of winter healthy and is able to start growing antlers um, immediately when it should. And, and in, at the rate it could. could. Um, deer will select uh, food uh, based on palatability, availability, and nutritional nutritional content. They they will eat upwards of 700 different species of plants. So it's not uh, a matter of you know, you know having the right plants around. There's a lot of plants that they'll consume. There's certain ones that they will select for uh, and have a higher nutritional quality quality to them but they will eat a lot of different food um, you can just look at you know the neighborhoods in suburbia and every plant that they seem to put down gets eaten by deer if they have high deer levels uh, so they will eat just about anything but they will vary um, what they eat based on what's available uh, and over seasonally so there's certain uh, demands uh, that they have uh, during different times of year. So when they're growing antlers, they have a different demand in terms of protein content and other minerals than versus the winter uh, or fall when they're really looking for uh, foods high in, in, in carbohydrates to make sure they can bulk up enough uh, to make it through the year. So things like why you, know, why you see deer uh, out in soybean fields in uh, spring and summer versus you know why you know, we have that hunter's lull in October when the deer really are concentrated on acorns to try to bulk up there. They will pick certain foods at different times and that really is driven by what their needs are to survive. And then uh, the big thing that you have to be um, conscious of is how to know if your um, area has too many deer because if deer aren't able to get the food they need, they will start eating everything that's available to them. Uh, so you get um, Images like this where we have these browse lines where deer basically just ate every all the vegetation that was within reach of their mouths and that includes standing on their hind legs to reach it. Um, you get into these situations, it gets, you know, these animals that are in these areas are stressed. It restricts both the quantity of the food available and that quality food that they're looking for. Most likely the quality food will disappear first and then the quantity will second. Uh, this has negative impacts on both the deer herd, but also your ecosystem that they're living in. So, you know, if they're talking about a forest uh, ecosystem, you're not going to have, as you can see in the left picture, any kind of trees growing uh, on the ground uh, to help, you know, fill uh, voids of, of uh, dead trees or anything else. Um, it doesn't lead to a healthy forest. And deer really do well in, in like most wildlife, in well-managed forests, so healthy forests. It provides them a lot of food, uh, everything they need to survive. So if they get to the point where they're eating themselves out of house and home, that's something you have to be conscious of. And finally, um, a lot of folks, and this is the commercial side of the industry, um, we are in a state that feeding deer is legal and baiting deer is legal for hunting, and there's a lot of folks that do that. Um, you should be conscious of what that actually means. Um, baiting deer and feeding deer minerals is good, very good at bringing deer to an area. And if you're doing something like a population survey or hunting, it's good for that. But you should know that if you think that's really going to um, carry deer through and provide um, all these minerals and nutrients that the deer don't have access to in the wild and it's going to make bigger antlers grow. Well, the science doesn't back that up. There's been no studies in the wild that have shown that giving deer mineral blocks or mineral su supplements actually influences antler size. Um, it just, they have the minerals available to them um, in the landscape. They, they actually are almost saturated uh, with them and they're not really limited to that. It's usually more just overall nutritional quality, not the minerals that uh, affect antler growth. Um, the downside to baiting and mineral licks um, is a disease concern. Um, it, when you are congregating animals into a specific area, diseases like CWD or chronic wasting disease or bovine tuberculosis um, are all things that spread by contact of individuals uh, or saliva. So when you congregate animals into an area, you're ask, actually raising the risk of the disease spreading through the population. Uh, so though baiting and, and feeding deer is legal, it's one that we don't necessarily want to do uh, a whole lot. Uh, so feeding year round isn't necessarily a great idea uh, because you're raising the risk for disease spread. Thankfully, um, we are one of the few states in the nation right now that does not have chronic wasting disease. 
Um, they actually just announced yesterday that Oregon was added to the list of, of states that have it, uh, which brings us upwards of about 32 different states uh, with chronic wasting disease. And it's one that, you know, it, it is a, a big concern. Um, it's a potential health hazard for humans. So we want to try to minimize risks associated with spreading disease. Um, on top of disease risks, uh, we also have negative effects on surrounding wildlife. Uh, baiting can actually impact, uh, or long-term feeding can impact game bird populations like turkeys or quail, uh, because you're actually raising uh, your mesopredator populations. Just think about how, you know, those folks that have deer feeders, uh, how many times have you seen pictures of about 10 to 15 raccoons trying to get all the food out of there? Well, you're keeping those populations high, you're feeding raccoons, but they're not just gonna feed only on the corn that you're putting out. Uh, they're gonna go around looking for, for um, turkey eggs, quail eggs, and they're probably a bigger problem for turkeys uh, than say, you know, our coyotes and bobcats, because they're they're really effective at finding the, the nest and they actually just chase the hen off and, and then eat all the eggs. So you need to be conscious of that. Now, like I said, it's a legal, um, legal thing in Kentucky, and I'm not going to tell you not to do it. Uh, just be conscious when you make these decisions on whether or not you want to feed year-round or actually use uh, bait during the season. Understand the risks that are associated with it, and maybe try to think about minimizing that. You know, Only bait during hunting season, don't feed year-round, because you really aren't getting a nutritional benefit uh, for the herd. Uh, you're better off doing things like population management and age management to help get bigger bucks. Uh, to give you a visual of how um, important nutrition is uh, and how tied it actually is to soil quality, um, they did a study in Mississippi looking at the antler score range, so your average growth score based on the soil areas of, of the state. Uh, and you look, the, the areas uh, with the highest soil quality, uh, particularly the delta areas of the, on the river, uh, had by far the largest antlers. Uh, and then when you get down to like the southeast region of the state, which is a really low quality sandy soil, they had overall the smallest antlers. Regardless of how much feeding was going on and baiting, because in Mississippi you can do all of that, it didn't carry through to the actual population. Um, well, thankfully, uh, in terms of soil quality, you know, one of the reasons why we have so many horses in this state is we have really good limestone soil, uh, which has all the minerals associated that go into the plants that help deer be healthy. So we really don't, like I said, need those mineral licks to help keep our population um, high and getting the, the minerals they need. We have it naturally occurring within the state. Um, so I wanted to just kind of show that as, as a, a, a big part of, you know, how important soil quality, forest quality can actually influence your antlers and, and deer herd health. Genetics is another big component, and you hear this a lot, um, especially uh, in Texas um, and around any kind of high fence operation. Uh, genetics is a really complicated thing to manage for even within high fences and it's almost impossible to do it uh, in a wild environment. Uh, there's two reasons for that. Um, the first uh, and the most difficult is how do you uh, really know what the, you know, how do you tell that doe that's walking by you how big her antlers are in her genes, you know. Um, antlers can be uh, dictated by both the male and female, so how do you determine that doe's influence on antler size? Um, you know, we look at the expression of, of antlers in males, and it's, it's easy to see, right? You, you see a, the number of inches that are walking in front of you. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that with a doe. You, you just look at whether the deer is healthy or not. Um, another big thing that influences um, the ability to manage for, for large antlers uh, is this combination of age, uh, right, so your buck doesn't reach its full um, value. You can't really tell how big it's going to be until it's four and a half, five and a half, six and a half years old. Well, the problem is that um, genetics research has shown that about 40 or 50 percent of the breeding of does actually occurs by one and a half to two and a half years old, year old bucks. That's in pen studies where there's five and a half, four and a half year old bucks that are in the pen with them that are supposed to be doing all the breeding, uh, at least we thought. Now we understand that, you know, the younger bucks actually are getting just as much or a little bit less breeding than the adult bucks. So they, you know, have uh, the ability to pass down their genes for their antlers even before you can understand how, how much uh, antler they're going to put on. 
Um, and, you know, at one and a half, two and a half years old, the nutrition level at age of birth really becomes a bigger factor in expression of those antlers. So it gets very difficult uh, to manage in a public le- or on a, a, a non-fence level uh, any kind of genetic influence. Um, even on a fence level, it can take upwards of 15, 20 years to really get a grasp of what's going on um, within the genetics of the population uh, at, you know, at a highly managed level where you're able to take out all the deer you need to take out to ensure that only the genes you want to pass down are being passed down. So it gets very complicated and, and therefore really for most folks that are, are managing their properties, um, especially within Kentucky, you're not going to be able to, to take care of that genetics component. And um, it's even more difficult when we consider we only have one um, buck tag available to hunters each year. Now, the sex ratio principle, uh, it relates to two things. Um, first is the buck to doe ratio. Uh, and then also, you have to throw in here a population density uh, consideration. So sex ratio, so the number of bucks versus the number of bows, does or females within a population. And the more equal this is, the better it is in terms of herd health, um, because the more bucks you are, are out there during breeding season, that means the more does are bred during their first estrus cycle. And the shorter um, month-wise, the um, the rut is. And the, lo- the why that's important is if you have a lot of does that are going into a second and third estrus, say in December or January or even February, the bucks won't stop running as long as there's uh, estrogen in the environment uh, that they're detecting. So they'll run themselves ragged and all of a sudden you have uh, deer that really aren't focusing on eating in, in January and February uh, when they uh, really need to pack on those pounds. You know, bucks can lose upwards of 30 to 40 percent of their body weight um, during the rut because of mating, um, behavior. So the sooner they're done with that mating season, the quicker they can start packing on those pounds, uh, and getting themselves healthier, uh, to make it through the winter. Um, it is possible for even, you know, with the you know, highly, uh, nutritious environment that we have, that if we have a bad weather event, say we get, you know, 10 to 15 inches of snow and those bucks are stressed that they won't actually survive the winter. Uh, unlikely because we don't have those number of days with snow on the ground that doesn't melt. Uh, so the deer won't be stressed that long, but it is possible. So the more, the closer you are to a one-to-one ratio, the better it is in terms of making sure that all the does get bred when they need to get bred and keeping that rutting period shorter. Um, unfortunately, this is very tough, but a realistic number around one to two is a really good goal to have. Um, if you're looking at this field here and you see, uh, you know, 9, 10, 11 does out there and, you know, you're doing, paying attention to your herd and you're seeing one or two bucks, you really should think about doing some population management to bring that down. Um, The other thing is when you have high buck to doe ratios, those does are going to get bred and they're going to reproduce. Uh, So it gets really hard to bring population levels back into check if you're not harvesting does and bringing that ratio down. Even with a one-to-one buck to doe ratio, your population may be too high for the landscape uh, that is present in. Um, so you need to make sure that your deer herd health, uh, other signs that we're going to talk about, the things that you're going to monitor are all in check, even at one to one ratio. But the closer that ratio is to one to one, the better. Um, there's two things here. You know, I mentioned with too many does, one of the problems, but you can actually get to the level. Um, one of the properties I, I did my PhD in Illinois, one of the properties had an incredibly high doe harvest rate by the hunters. Um, it was a public property and they were issuing management tags to lower the population. Well, what ended up happening is they had almost a two to one buck to doe ratio and the bucks actually would, would leave the property looking for does because of all the competition. Well, this isn't, you know, for them, it wasn't a bad thing because their management strategy was to lower the population. But if you were a hunter on that property trying to target bucks, um, or a specific buck, it may actually end up leaving and going to the neighbor's property. Uh, and get harvested or, you know, not be around where you can hunt. So you may end up having issues with actual buck behavior if that ratio is skewed the other way uh, towards higher bucks. But that's a lot harder to do. The last um, principle is dealing with land area. Um, We talk about area. To implement certain management strategies, you have to have uh, large acreage uh, in your control or under similar management strategies. What we would consider a trophy management strategy for deer, uh, you're looking at needing about 8,000 acres. 
Um, for something what we would call like a quality deer management uh, strategy, you can do something like that on about 1,000 acres. And really the, the reason these acreage is important is because a, um, a deer's home range um, for, you know, a doe, excuse me, is about 150, 200 acres. Uh, now for a buck, it's smaller during um, the summer, spring, summer, and uh, however, when they get closer to the pre-rut and rut, that home range expands drastically. It could be upwards of a square mile to two square miles, uh, which one square mile is 640 acres. So if it spans to two square miles, you're looking at somewhere around 1,200 acres. So if you're going to ensure that the deer survives um, based on hunting pressure, you need to make sure that that deer is spending the majority of the time under your management strategy uh, or your management regime. Um, there's ways of around um, dealing with the fact you may not own a thousand acres, you may not own a hundred acres. Uh, you could do things like cooperatives, uh, which are quite popular, especially in the South, where you get you know bring your neighbors together, talk about what you want to do and what you in terms of hunting um, goals, uh, management goals, whether or not you want to shoot big bucks or just you know some folks like to hunt, to fill the freezer. Um, but coming under understanding and an agreement may help keep those deer alive or, you know, surviving the way you want to want them to, even with smaller acreage, if you can just come together and come to an agreement. To give you an idea of how often deer move, this is a couple figures from um, my PhD work in Illinois. Uh, the figure uh, in black and white there has the home ranges outlined of some bucks uh, there. Um, and the lines outside of those home, home ranges are actually the uh, excursion movements, the exploratory movements um, that these deer will go on um, throughout the year, but they occur uh, sometimes at higher rates uh, during the rut, uh, especially for older bucks. So if you're um, managing a farm that's 500 acres, the deer are majority, on that farm the majority of the time, all of a sudden they decide to leave it. Um, and you know upwards of potentially six and a half miles away There's a lot of other properties that they're going to walk across that you don't know what the management strategy is in place So that's why when we talk about land area It can actually be pretty influential on on the ability to keep deer alive uh, And as we talked about age is the most important factor when, when we're dealing with uh, antler growth and antler size So keeping deer alive is really important and that's why those trophy managements, you know, you have to be able to have those square miles to keep deer within the same management strategy. So, we talked about the principles of deer management. Now, you know, what can you guys do to really help manage your deer herd or understand how, what's going on with your deer herd? Well, the first thing that, you know, you could easily do is an initial population assessment. And this is really, um, if you're going to go into a management strategy for your deer, it's critical to understand where you're starting from in terms of your deer herd health, uh, the number of deer you have on the property, what's available to them, and where can you go from there? Um, what management strategies can you put in place to change those things? Well, some of the data you can collect to do an initial deer herd health uh, assessment are things like body weight, the age of the deer, antler characteristics, lactation rates, overall body condition. We're looking at fat, fat, of, fat within the deer itself. Um, for example, the antler characteristics, you want to look at like main bean length, circumference around the bases. Uh, number of points is not as important, but it can be an indicator for your younger deer. Inside and outside spread are all things you can keep track of. Uh, these things, are, as deer age and also deer get healthier, will change and grow. Um, and simply to age a deer, all you need to do is an, a jawbone extraction where you get a, a pair of loppers, a, a jawbone spreader. You can buy those off the internet. Uh, you basically remove the lower jaw and go from there. Um, the important thing to know is that of all the ages that really tell you how well your deer herd is going, the one and a half year age class, specifically your, juvenile, your females in this age class, is critical. It's a great indicator of your environmental health. These, this age demographic, this, this age group, um, is most vulnerable, the females are most vulnerable to getting kicked out of high quality habitat. You, know, you think about the adult doe is gonna make sure that they have enough food to have more fawns the next year, so they're not gonna necessarily allow that, that um, juvenile female, even though it may be their own, to access the same areas. So those deer may get pushed to the fringes, not have the high quality forage or the best habitat available to them. So they will exhibit the, the symptoms of an unhealthy deer herd first. 
So aging deer by jawbone, um, what you're looking at is you're going to use is what's called tooth wear and replacement. It's relatively easy to a point. Um, and what you're doing is you're, you're using the dental characteristics that change as they age. This includes the number of teeth that are present, the number of the certain types of teeth, the bicuspid, tricuspid, um, and the specifically the wear on certain teeth. Uh, and eventually as the deer get older, it's the wear on all of the teeth. Uh, and you're looking at how uh, much dentine ha is visible uh, as that enamel wears off. There's more and more dentine visible um, on the tooth itself. There's some issues with this. Um, because it's tooth wear and replacement, deer actually um, get certain numbers of teeth and replace certain teeth up to two and a half years old. It's guaranteed. After two and a half years old, three and a half, four and a half, five, the wear patterns uh, sometimes are not very predictable. Uh, the further south you go, the more predictable it is. You can go upwards of eight and a half, nine and a half, ten and a half year old deer in Texas, no problem. Uh, however, when you go further north, the wear on the teeth changes. Um, they tend to browse on different items. They may choose, choose more corn. They may choose soybean. Uh, and even within certain areas, the tooth wear is different. So it becomes um, difficult after three and a half years old to actually age deer um, the more north you go. We're kind of on the line. Um, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, it works. But when you get to Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Indiana, it doesn't. Um, so I would say you can probably um, predictably age deer to three and a half years old in Kentucky using tooth wear and replacement. Now, there's a, if you're, you're really curious, there is an alternative to this. Um, you can actually pull one of the front incisors um, and have it sent off to a lab where they'll cut it and look at, uh, at the cement manuli. Um, similar to a tree, uh, the teeth will show age rings. Uh, and after being stained and looked at under a microscope, you can get a, a more accurate estimate of uh, deer age regardless of how t the teeth wear. And that's how we know that, you know, in the north they don't work. It, t tooth wear doesn't work in the north versus the south because we use the cement and annuli if we have to. Now, if you uh, do want to age the deer by their teeth, um, this is a simple way of looking at it. Um, you know, from a fawn all the way up to six years old. The key here, I'm going to go over to three and a half. So it's on the one side, the, the left side here. When you look at a fawn jaw, now outside of the fact that, you know, most folks can fairly, you know, fairly easily tell a fawn from an adult based on body size. But to confirm this, sometimes you'll be surprised if you have an early fawn that's really healthy, um, it may be upwards of 80, 90, 100 pounds uh, given your area. Um, so they may get confused with one and a half year old. So if you're really worried about mining that one and a half, you want to make sure you're actually aging deer correctly, um, even within the fawn year and a half old age range. Now a fawn will only have five teeth. Um, so you simply just look at the lower jaw and how many teeth, this is not counting the incisors, so you're looking at the premolars and molars, uh, how many teeth are available on the jaw. Now a, at a year and a half old, what will happen is uh, in the back of the jaw, they'll have a new tooth emerge. Their sixth, their final molar will pop out of the jaw. Um, so they'll have actually four tricuspid teeth and two bicuspid teeth. And the cuspids are just the, the, you know, the, the bumps associated with um, the tooth in, in around the uh, jaw there. Um, at two and a half years old, what ends up happening is uh, the third tooth will actually get pushed out and a new bicuspid teeth will emerge uh, in its place. So if you actually harvest a deer later in the year, uh, so a year and a half old deer, this, you know, this tooth exchange may happen starting in January or February. Um, you may see a tooth that's actually different uh, place relative to the other teeth. It may just be emerging. Um, so that would be a good indicator that that deer is going to its second, you know, into its second two and a half year uh, age. Um, but, you know, at this point, when you get to two and a half years old, you have three bicuspid teeth and then three tricuspid teeth uh, in the mouth. At that point, you know it's at least a two and a half year old. Um, and then when you look at, you know, that bicuspid tooth, that new one will basically have no wear. So when you look at the amount of wear at three and a half, you'll have some dentine that's now visible on it. It won't be as pointy. Uh, you'll know that that deer, you know, if there's some enamel showing or some dentine showing that the deer is at least three and a half years old potentially older than that. So after that, you get into different wear patterns. 
but what you're realistically looking at is the, the amount of dentine that's available increases with age. So you look at the four and a half, you know, that not, the amount of black that's showing on the teeth uh, is drastically less than, say, at six and a half. Um, and deer are capable of living upwards of 18 years. Uh, there was a study done here at the University of Kentucky down in the southeast part of the state, even on Redbird, it's on Redbird uh, within the Daniel Boone. Uh, they had aged a deer out with some annuli at 16 plus years old. It was a female and it was still having fawns. So they can, even on public land, get very old. Um, so it's not impossible to harvest deer that's in double digits, uh, especially on private property if they're in areas that haven't been hunted before. But like I said, the one that you really want to pay attention to if you want to monitor deer herd health is that yearling, where they have uh, six teeth, four uh, tricuspids, and two bicuspids. The next step on top of you know, monitoring some of these uh, body characteristics is to do an initial population survey. Now. Um, you want to do this and you know pay attention to, to your harvest records, make sure you understand what's going on in your property, keep records of your harvest. But the population survey really over time will allow you to, tr to track uh, changes in the population level uh, at the property you're, you're surveying. Um, it's not 100% accurate, but it'll allow you to look at trends of the population. Um, and that's enough to know whether or not when you put in a different management strategy or regime like trying to lower the population, it will tell you if you've met your goal, uh, especially after, you know, two years of collecting data uh, under the same regime. Um, there's a couple different ways of doing this. Uh, there's pellet counts, uh, there's camera surveys, um, and you want to make sure that, you know, some folks keep track of the number of deer seen per hunt. That's not necessarily a good indicator of population numbers. Uh, for example, say, you know, you consistently are able to hunt maybe a dozen times a year. What happens at the one year, it's a, you know, by chance you have five or six days that are incredibly foggy. You're not able to see as far um, out in the woods or in the field. Uh, therefore, your what we call detection rate of deer is going to be lower. So all of a sudden, you know, that we have a year like that and you may see half the number of deer well, if you go just on this, you know, pure metric of number of deer seen per hunt, you would think the population crashed. But that might not necessarily be true. So you can keep those data, and I, you know, there's never uh, a situation where more data is a problem. It's just understanding the value of each type of data. So doing something that's systematic, where you can bring deer into, um, consistently into an area um, over time to understand, you know, what's going on is a better uh, indicator for the population level uh, and trend of the population than say something like number of deer seen per hunt. So the camera survey method is probably the easiest method for a landowner or a hunt lease or you know you guys to, to uh, put in place in the area you, you um, hunt in um, or are monitoring the population. Um, simply because the cameras are relatively cheap now, they're reliable, um, there's a um, they have good detection rates for pictures. You can get a whole bunch of them. They're no longer the uh, film version. They're digital, so you can get a lot of pictures. You don't have to worry about paying to develop your film or running out of picture space. Um, so they have a lot of benefits. Um, in tandem with that, we have a couple different survey uh, methods that work really well. They're easy to use. Anyone can implement them. The one I would suggest uh, using is what we call the Jacobson camera survey method. It's easy to implement uh, if you have a simple spreadsheet or writing out ability on a piece of paper, you can actually calculate how many deer you have on, on the property you surveyed. And what this survey does, um, it's basically a grid design where you would grid out your property. Uh, it's recommended to have a 100 acre to 160 acre grid. Um, you can place the camera anywhere within that grid. Um, and then what you do is you can either use an attraction uh, like corn or mineral block or not. Uh, as long as you do the same thing at all camera locations. What it does is it uses the unique buck photo rate to extrapolate that rate to all the other deer that you get on camera, so the does and the fawns that you can't determine individuals. So by using the antler characteristics of the bucks in um, either late summer or fall when you can tell what they're going to look like, um, you can ID individuals, and based on those number of individuals you figure out, you calculate an individual uh, visitation rate and average that across all the individuals, and you can apply that rate to your does and then to the fawns, so on. 
it allows you then, based on the number of total number of pictures you get, to come up with a population estimate. Now, all of that sounds really confusing, right? Um, the good thing is, uh, by the time you are going to survey next summer, there will be an extension publication that your uh, agent will have available to them that lays this all out um, with the spreadsheet available to you and everything. So by next year, you'll have this available to you if you want to implement it. Um, it is a great way of monitoring individual farms, uh, small acreage, large acreage. Um, it does take time to go through and identify individual bucks. Um, so there's a little bit of time going through the pictures, but you're looking at the pictures anyway. So with a little bit more effort, you can actually get a really good idea of how many deer you have around. Now, applying your data. So you, I just told you a bunch of things you can collect. What does this really mean? Well, like I said, you have to monitor those one and a half year olds closely, and really it's those females. So you have to be willing to harvest those one, some one and a half year old female deer. You want to look at those deer, and some of the things that you want to look that are indicators of bad herd health. So your lactation rates for a healthy deer herd for a year and a half old female, so the number of, this is an indicator of the number of fawns, female fawns, so when they were a year old, less than a year old, that were bred, that they were first year alive. So if 20 to 30 percent of those fawns or those one and a half, now one and a half year olds during hunting season have lactation uh, signs, so whether that be um, udders that were actually used or still are putting off milk, that is a good sign that that doe uh, was healthy enough uh, their first year to fawn and, and maintain that fawn alive for a period of time. It could have gotten eaten by a predator. It could have gotten mowed over by um, a hay um, tractor or whatever else, but it was able to take a being bred and take that fawn and have it um, in the spring. That's a good indicator of health. If you have somewhere around 0 to 10% and you, you need to take a closer look at the weights of your deer, um, especially those one and a half year old deer. Do they, are they in line with what other folks are saying their deer are weighing in other areas uh, of the county? Um, what, if they are not, that means you probably uh, have a problem with your herd health. You either have a too high of a deer density population or there's not enough food available to them on the landscape. And we can, we're going to briefly talk about some of the ways you can quickly get some food on the landscape here in a couple slides but you need to look at what's available to them long-term and come up with a management strategy on increasing the amount of food on the landscape. Adult does should be somewhere around 60 to 70% lactation rate, and that's another good indicator. If they're really low and you're not having a lot of does with fawns, then there could be some more issues even on top of what, um, you know, uh, even on top of one and a half year olds. Uh, if the adult does aren't healthy enough to have fawns, you have a serious either population problem or nutrition problem uh, within the herd. Uh, sometimes you'll have situations where, you know, you think, you know, 60% of adult does should have fawns, right? Well, there's issues where they lose the fawns or sometimes there's um, a traumatic event or whatever else. It may cause them not to have a fawn that year. Uh, over time, though, if the adult does are falling in the 60, 50, 40% range, you have a problem with your herd health. Uh, other things you can look at, so if you have a large number of spikes uh, present on your property um, that you hunt or that you're managing, uh, this may actually indicate you need to harvest more does. Um, because if you have does that are, are having elongated ruts or estrus cycles, they're not getting bred their first cycle, um, that means they're having their fawns later. Uh, so you need to get either the population lowered overall or bring that buck to doe ratio back closer to one to one. Um, these late born males will, you know, eventually catch up, but it's a sign that there's something else going on. You can use it as an indicator uh, of, you know, herd health. So I told you two problematic situations. Um, so what do you, you know, we're going to talk about a few more potential strategies, but you know, what happens if you have something going on or what happens if you don't have something going on? You want to make sure that you have a management strategy in place if, um, on the property that you're hunting or with the group of folks you're on or the property you're leasing um, if you're really into deer herd management. If you're not into it, um, a lot of this doesn't really matter because deer are going to be out there. We're not going to lose deer. Um, if you're out there to meet hunt, then, you know, sometimes this isn't really applicable to you. But if you're trying to get bigger antlers, then you have to kind of have, sit down and think about how can I make my deer healthier? How can I make adjustments to the herd? And you really should think about things in a two to three year basis uh, and a longer term basis than that. Um, 
put in initial uh, strategies like uh, I'm going to put some food plots in to raise nutritional uh, availability on the landscape or I'm going to do some um, early successional habitat alterations. I might do a clear cut and have that grow up to help uh, provide more browse on the landscape and also more fawning cover. Um, you want to look at how those things are impacting the herd. Um, it's going to take, there's going to be a little bit of lag time. It's going to take some time. So every two to three years, you want to make sure you have a pretty good assessment of those strategies and whether or not you need to alter them uh, to reach your goal. Um, Lowering population density or altering buck to doe ratios is a really common initial strategy. It allows you to, to quickly understand um, if you know you have a population that's too high, uh, lowering it, is that going to affect how um, the health of the animals that are on the landscape? Or is there other things that are needed like actually putting in food plots or other forest management strategies? Um, if you have poor herd health issues, you want to make sure you have a combination of both forest and land health uh, in your strategy on top of your carrying capacity. Understanding, you know, if you have too high of deer level, um, you can simply lower that, but you're probably going to have to try to do some things to raise nutritional quality on the landscape. Um, and quality forest management uh, helps deer, but it, and it can also help your pocketbook. Uh, quality habitat like early successional habitat provides a lot of food to deer. It's also really good at, at raising fawn survival, raising turkey survival, raising quail survival, all those things, and winter buck survival. It puts a lot of food available to deer even if we have uh, a large snowstorm because most of the food is sitting at about two to three feet high right in reach even if we get 15, 16 inches of snow. And remember that feeding year-round doesn't address the problem. It just kind of kicks the can down the road. You want to uh, make sure you're addressing these things with landscape changes or popula population level changes, um, not just, I'm going to just put more food out there uh, over time. Remember, it raises that disease risk. Uh, also keeps those populations higher for longer, um, making those forest and land health problems even worse over time. And make sure you're realistic about what your, your goals are for your deer population. 170 and 180 inch deer are not the norm. Um, something you know that's a reasonable goal is letting your deer get to three and a half, four and a half years old, you're going to have 140 inch, 150 inch deer. Um, so seeing them on the landscape, you know, not necessarily harvesting them is also accomplishing that goal. The harvest, you know, as these deer get older, they also get smarter, they learn more, so they're harder to harvest. So um, how, you know, how you assess success, uh, needs to take that into account. Uh, some other popular, um, deer management topics include predator management. This really has come out of the fact that coyotes have, um, spread, uh, from, you know, the central plain states now into the Southeast and, and they're actually going even down through, uh, Central America into South America. Well, the deer um, populations in the southeast really did not have to worry about these as a predator. They had bobcats um, and actually red wolves previously, but coyotes were something new. Um, so when deer populations began to crash uh, in some levels in some places in the southeast, uh, the higher level of coyotes um, and people seeing coyotes uh, carrying fawns around, the thought was that coyotes were what's limiting populations. And in some areas they are. Unfortunately, uh, coyotes are incredibly hard to control their population levels. Um, so there's a bunch of studies that uh, got launched uh, from University of Georgia, North Carolina State, um, Auburn University, looking at this dynamic of coyote and deer population levels, and more specifically, fawn survival. Uh, and a couple of these studies went in on 8,000, 10,000 acre property and just trapped coyotes year-round. Um, removing upwards of, you know, 200 coyotes on a property, uh, you know, keep in mind it was a large property, uh, but drastically lowering the predator um, density on the property. And over time, they saw, you know, the first year they did it, they saw an initial increase in fawn survival, uh, but after two, three, four years, they never didn't have that increase in fawn survival anymore, even with the continued removal of coyotes. Um, so, what you know came down to was that um, the efficiency of removing coyotes and thinking about how much effort it takes to remove coyotes um, 
and the costs associated with that, they weren't seeing the, the return on the, on the deer populations, even in these extreme situations. And some of that has to do with the fact that the more coyotes you remove, the individuals that remain, the healthier they are because the amount of food available to them increases. Um, and those coyotes in turn then have even more uh, coyotes the next year. Uh, so you actually almost boom your population the next year. Um, so it gets very difficult dealing with these things with these coyotes, and it it was estimated that somewhere around you need to remove somewhere around seventy to seventy five percent of your coyote population within a localized area to even decrease the population the next year. Um, you have a lot of movement of coyotes from other areas; uh, they will disperse upwards of twenty miles. Uh, from where they were born. So you have a lot of, of new individuals bouncing around the landscape. Um, there's evidence now that there's three different behavior patterns of coyotes where you have the resident coyotes, you have migratory kind of always cruising around coyotes that never set up a home range. And then you have these coyotes that cruise around uh, until a, a home range opens up, in which case they immediately move into it and fill the void. So even as you're removing coyotes, there's almost like another individual waiting in the wing to just get that coyote out of there so it has now a spot to fill in. Um, so unfortunately, um, in response to this, what we see is that removing coyotes actually doesn't help deer populations. Uh, it doesn't really probably help turkey populations either because you know the bigger thing to help turkey populations is probably um, making sure you have enough early successional habitat on the ground um, that it makes it difficult for these predators to search out um, the nests and then also the fawns um, within the landscape. A study in southern Illinois showed that the uh, amount of mixture of habitat, so the amount of edge available in the landscape actually is a better uh, predictor of fawn survival than, you know, whether or not a predator was present. Um, simply because what it does is it, it, it protects them from predators, it also provides more food on the landscape. Um, so making sure you have a mixture of habitat on your property, if you're thinking you have a coyote problem, put some more early, success, more early successional habitat on your property is going to be a better fix than trying to continuously trap coyotes off the property to lower the predator um, densities. One of the other uh, popular management strategies that actually can um, be pretty um, productive on, on uh, properties is um, implementing some food plots, putting in some food plots. Um, there's some misconceptions. Uh, you have to make sure you're, you understand what those are. Um, food plots will attract deer to a certain area. Uh, that can be a very good advantage for hunting or wildlife viewing. However, um, food plots by themselves, there's no data to support the fact that it will grow larger ant antlers just by putting more food on the landscape. Um, you need to make sure it's just part of the management strategy, that you're, you're thinking about population levels and making sure they're in line with what can be supported uh, on, on the property. On top of making sure that your forested habitat is able to you know, produce browse and, and early successional habitat available to, to deer uh, and fawns and everything else. So food plots is a, a cog in the, the management um, machine. It's not the simple sole solution. Making sure that your age and uh, other proper herd management is, is paired with this is, is critical to the success. Um, however, um, it is a very um, good way at, at helping manage your deer, increase deer herd health. Um, there's a couple different things that you can think about. You know, there's lots of different um, mixtures of seeds and types of seeds and, and um, that all is, is an hour long talk in itself. Um, but, you know, you can find what you like and what you think works in your property and you should monitor it just like anything else and find that out. Um, there's food plot sizes that range from a tenth of an acre all the way up to a 10 acre field. Uh, one of the, the nice um, designs that I think is really um, a great mixture of both early successional habitat and food plots is this one that's imaged here, where you have a, a couple different strips of, of actual planted uh, food along with in between those strips you actually have a native grasses or old field early successional habitat thick cover um, great you know immediately available to turkeys and deer and quail right next to a food source uh, so the animals can quickly escape into cover if they're they have a predator around um, the problem is you know it, it, it can be tough to hunt in um, but you know something like this provides you with ample uh, areas to see the deer if they come out of the cover uh, and provides that extra uh, early successional habitat 
paired with uh, the food available to them. Um, initial, you know, overall scheme for food plots, you want to determine the area on your property that you want to place the plot, thinking about how you can get in and out, how much you need to get in and out, determine what you want to plant, make sure you're conducting soil tests and bed preparation, uh, preparation and soil amendment if it needs lime, nitrogen, those kind of things, all based on the soil tests. Uh, most of your extension offices uh, provide soil testing. Some of them provide it for free, um, others do not. Uh, but it's relatively cheap either way. I think the most I've ever heard it for a soil test is uh, 6 or $7. Um, so it's not um, that expensive, um, and it's worth its weight in gold when you look at the, the, the increase in productivity uh, of whatever plot you put in. Obtain the seed that you want. Follow the planning instructions. Maintain that plot. Make sure you're doing your weed spraying or any other um, issues uh, associated with um, – you know, invasives, those kind of things. Monitor the success of the plot and ass assess it after two to three years and make changes as needed. One of the other things that you can do in terms of forest management and land management, uh, you, you know, you don't want to overlook forest management uh, as part of your management strategy for deer. Um, you know, you could have all the food available in the world and if you walk into the woods and it looks like that picture there, um, and it's wide open. There's nowhere for deer to hide. There's no thermal cover. There's no fawning cover. There's no food available to them. If it snows, that's not a good situation. So you can do things uh, that promote um, great regeneration uh, of the forest. You can also do things on top of that uh, with timber stand improvement, uh, where on the picture, the other picture here, you have what's called a hinge cut or we uh, browse cut. You go in um, at just over, you know, you find trees that are about pole size, a little bit larger. Um, usually they're the low value trees, something like your maples uh, or tulip poplars, and you actually cut them, leaving a little bit of the tree connected to the base. And what that does is it makes sure that the tree remains alive for a few years, and it will throw off these sprouts, uh, which are really high quality browse for the animals. It also then, you have all this um, cover really close to the ground. It provides uh, security cover, bedding cover, fawning cover on top of the food available to them. So it's a strategy that you can go in, uh, do a couple acres here and there. It's a great way to manipulate bedding areas for hunting. Um, go in and put a couple of these down after two, three years, all of a sudden you have the thickest area in your property and you made it happen in a certain place that you wanted to, it to happen so that you can effectively hunt it. Finally, I want to quickly cover some deer diseases, and deer carry several different diseases and parasites, um, things like bot flies, uh, larvae may come out of your deer's nose when you hang it up, when you harvest it, don't be alarmed, it's okay. Um, but there's three really big diseases that hunters and agriculture are very concerned about, uh, and ones that we should be aware of within Kentucky, we should be on the lookout for, and also ones that you potentially could have seen even this year. The first and probably the scariest one for deer management side is chronic wasting disease. Um, this was discovered out west in the early 1960s. Uh, it's believed to have actually evolved from scabies. And what it is is actually uh, mad cow for, for deer. Uh, it's a malforming uh, protein, a prion, um, that builds up in the nervous system of the deer over time. Um, they won't show clinical signs uh, until they're at least one and a half years old. Sometimes they won't show clinical signs until they're much older. Uh, the transmission of this disease is by direct contact, saliva, and potentially through soil. It's been shown to actually be able to survive in soil for upwards of two years uh, and picked up by the vegetation growing in that soil. So it, it can survive a very, very long time in the environment, which makes it incredibly difficult to manage. Uh, this map, uh, unfortunately, on the, uh, is uh, now out of date. Um, there's at least four more uh, states that can be added to it um, on the right. Uh, including Arkansas, Oregon. Um, and the big thing that happens to deer is they, they um, start acting odd. They'll, they'll not act like they're scared of things. They'll start becoming emaciated. Uh, they could have drooling come from their mouth. They'll walk in circles. Um, it's been shown that um, they, even if they're not showing the clinical signs, they uh, will have lower survival rates and lower production rates. Um, associated with the population. So this is, this is one that uh, when the po it gets into the population, it really destroys the health of the herd uh, over a long period of time. 
Uh, one of the ones that happened to, uh, uh, we happen to have a giant outbreak of this year in the state, and one that we seem to have an outbreak about every five to seven years, uh, is EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, or also called blue tongue. Um, there are two different uh, diseases, but very similar in how they uh, affect deer. Uh, both of them are spread by the uh, Concoyes midge, uh, the noceums midge, um, to the deer. So the deer, uh, the midge is infected with the disease. Um, and uh, then bites a deer, transmitting it to the deer itself. This one does not spread by contact of deer. So regardless uh, um, if the deer is infected with it, it cannot actually spread it to another deer. The midge has to be the one that spreads it to the deer. Uh, and how this really works is uh, if the deer are infected, what ends up happening is they actually overheat, um, which is why they run to water, they try to cool down, and usually that's where they're found. Uh, death generally occurs with 24 to 48 hours. Uh, some deer can survive, and over time, immunity will build up within a population. So deer in the south uh, consistently have EHD present in their populations. Uh, they lose a very small percentage of it each year. Most deer survive. Um, and the reason why we tend to see this in drought years or hot years um, is that the midge actually breeds in mud flats. Um, they don't travel very far from those mud flats. Um, so as those water levels drop, it creates a large amount of breeding habitat for them. Their populations increase. Uh, alongside that, you now have deer that usually are able to get the moisture they need from the vegetation they're eating in the environment. Well, that's not happening because all the plants are, are dry. So they have to come and get more water from an actual pond. Well, that brings them to where the midges are. So it increases their risk of getting bit. So over, you know, during um, drought years and uh, dry years, we have these uh, potential outbreaks. Um, usually happens July and August because it coincides with when the, the midges are most prevalent with the environment. They are killed off um, at the first hard frost. Um, so we, you know, any year you have an EHD outbreak, you just hope that you have a really early frost to help minimize the, the impact of the, the disease. Um, the good thing is that, yeah, um, it's very usually a very localized issue where you may have one farm that's a mile um, or two, three miles away that doesn't have any impact where um, the uh, other farm that the 60 or 70% of the population is uh, lost. Uh, the last disease I want to talk about is bovine tuberculosis. Um, this is one that is a big concern for cattle producers. Uh, deer are a reservoir for the disease uh, and can spread it to cattle. Uh, there's a population that has bovine tuberculosis present in, it in the upper um, peninsula or upper lower peninsula of Michigan. This one is spread by contact between individuals. It's also how it's spread to cattle as deer impact or contact uh, cattle or other infected food sources. Um, what this does is basically uh, impacts deer by gradually uh, debilitating them, emaciation and intolerance to exercise, so it affects their ability to breathe uh, because they have these nodules that build up within the lungs. Uh, and it's a really good uh, indicator of whether or not the deer is uh, infected with it. When you open up the uh, chest cavity, uh, you'll look uh, at the lungs and in the upper picture there, you'll see uh, these nodules present in it. Uh, there is um, a very slight risk for humans. Um, so any kind you have a deer that exhibits that symptom, you want to contact your local um, private lands biologist and let them know to come out and take a look at the deer uh, to ensure that we don't have the disease present. And with that, I hope I um, raised some knowledge uh, of deer management and gave you some ideas of some things you can do on your properties. Um, and uh, I will take any questions. Matt, you covered a lot of content just now. That's for sure in a pretty short period of time. So, like I said, deer management <laughs> is a class in, unto itself, and I could teach this for an entire semester and then some. Right. So, I try to give the down and dirty, uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, spark some some areas that you can look into a little bit more if you're interested. All right. 
Well, folks, I would encourage you to please take a moment and get any questions that you have into the chat pod. If you are at a county extension office, your county agent can get those questions to us. And if you're at home, you can use your chat pod as well. Um, I did see a question on there a little bit earlier. We had some folks that are at home that were interested in that handout. Um, I, I think we'll be able to get that to you. I think, was it Larry? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Larry, yeah. yeah. Larry, if, if you want to take my email there and send me an email, I will send you the uh, PDF version of this talk. There you go. Thank you very much. So folks, I'm pleased, really, I encourage you, you know, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Springer here with us. He is our wildlife biologist here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And uh, you've been a great addition to our team so far, Matt. And uh, this is just another outstanding effort and the program that you've given. So we do have a question here about uh, whether uh, I can recommend a trail camera. Um, I've used many different versions of trail cameras um, and had a lot of success with basically anything that's about um, the $80, $90 price point and above. Um, and so to give you an example, I have enough faith in those lower end cameras that we're running our research project with a $100 camera instead of the three or $500 camera. Um, so they work really well. It, uh, a couple years ago, I'd say you'd probably have to spend about two to three hundred dollars, but that the the technology's come mm -hmm. so far that those lower end cameras really are just as good. Um, I'm not gonna to we're not allowed to, to talk about individual cameras, but I can tell you that you know you don't have to spend three hundred dollars to get a quality uh, camera that'll work to do what you need to do. Yeah. Good, maybe save some folks some money there. <laughs> I know Christmas is coming up, so yeah, that's that, idea. So. Hey, that's not a bad idea. You know, when you were talking about some of those diseases and stuff, I mean, obviously, it was obvious on the animals that we saw, but are there any other things that, you know, hunters or others should be looking for in the population as far as signs? Or I mean, or it'll be pretty obvious if the, the deer are sick. Unfortunately, um, a lot of times um, with deer diseases, uh, those obvious ones are, are at extremes, right? So, um, as a deer manager, you don't even necessarily want to see the obvious ones. You'd rather catch it when your surveillance is right. going on. And the state naturally is looking for, or they don't naturally, not naturally, but are consistently looking every year for the presence of CWD, bovine tuberculosis, and monitoring herd health. Because the sooner they catch it, the easier potentially it is to, to control. Um, so the big thing there are the pictures. Um, EHD is one that, you know, we can't really manage or, or deal with the trying to protect the herd from it. You adjust, you know, if the population really crashes, you adjust your doe harvest mm. so it can rebound quicker. Uh, CWD and bovine tuberculosis is, is going to be, you know, if you see an unhealthy deer uh, or harvest something that looks odd, call your private lands biologist uh, with Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Have them come out and take a look at it. Um, they're trained into what to look for, what right. sample to at least collect. Well, it's good. At least they've got announced a resource that they can check out. Looks like I've got some more stuff coming in. So there's a, the questions relating to the cameras, uh, the trip, I'm guessing that's the trip speed for the pictures, um, whether it needs to be faster than a third of a second or slower, uh, black, white, color, high resolution, low resolution. Um, so we use uh, cameras that, uh, have trigger speeds right around a half second. Um, a lot of times what we're doing is um, having, we conduct very short population surveys, so we will use bait during those surveys so the deer are standing still. Um, so it allows us to get away with those shorter, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the slightly longer right. trigger speeds. Um, the black, white color, so you have infrared, um, color pictures, flash pictures, black infrared. There's a lot of different options. Right. Um, some of it is user's choice. Um, Deer will respond to flashes, but generally they become tolerant to them after one or two pictures. Um, they can still see that infrared if it's directly in their eyes, regardless of what the package says. Um, but it does lower that response right. to the flash. So um, it's all matter of personal preference. The resolution level, I, I think you can get away with quality pictures at eight megapixels. Um, they make them that go up to really high levels of 16, 20, I think. Um, we just use an 8 megapixel. It, it gets what we need to for getting things done. It looks like I had a question about does the tongue swell up on blue tongue? Yes, the tongue will swell up and slightly discolored. That blue tongue is part of the whole coloration. It will look a little odd. Um, some of the other things you may see um, are... Um, so deer that actually get EHD or blue tongue that survive, um, one of the, the telltale signs that they have a disease um, is they'll, their hoofs will actually be elongated and brittle. Mm 
So you may have harvested a deer or, or may harvest a deer because we still have hunting season going on that has that symptom. Don't be alarmed. It's just a sign that the, you know, they survived the HD. Um, the deer is perfectly healthy uh, to, or perfectly safe to consume. Um, it's just one of those things that that's what they, in, you know, one of the indicators of their herd, it changes with, uh, within the animal when they have the disease. Um, somebody was asking about um, the recording. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website. If you found the link to this webinar, um, hopefully off of our website, uh, right near there, we'll be having the actual links to the recordings. We post them on YouTube. Um, thanks to Miss Renee Williams, who is behind the scenes in our production studio out there. Thank you, Renee. Um, she'll be the one who will take care of that recording for us. Um, usually, we hopefully will have this one up by mid next week or so um, after we get back from Thanksgiving. So I saw a question in here before we get a, ahead um how any idea how many deer have died from ehd um offhand i cannot tell you um kentucky department of fish and wildlife resources that had a report a deer um page associated with uh, the agency that had was updating itself daily on how many deer were being reported within each county um i believe it was upwards um last I don't, I don't want to go throw any correct numbers out here, but I know it was over 2,000. I think it was potentially over 3,000 uh, statewide. Uh, the hardest hit areas of the state were southeast Kentucky and eastern Kentucky in terms of what was reported. Um, that, you know, as kind of dealing with, you know, I talked about using uh, deer seen per hunt as a indicator and how there's some problems associated with that with because of detection rate. Um, you it's really hard to determine how many deer actually died because of EHD. We have those, that minimal confirmed number, um, but we don't, we aren't really able to extrapolate that to a good estimate of how, how many deer died in the population. Um, I'm sure that fish and wildlife biologists will be tracking the harvest very closely mm -hmm. uh, to get a better gauge on how much the population was uh, affected this year. Because there's, if there's less deer alive on the landscape, that, that harvest is going to go down. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a responsive management, but that's the best we have. All right. Matt, I saw another question in there I'll try to help them out with. Um, to find your local Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources private lands biologist, um, just go to your favorite search engine, type in Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources and private lands biologist, and it should come up pretty quickly in there. They have a whole section on managing your land, and then you can find it in there. If you run into any problems, um, let your county agent know and then get a hold of us. Um, but a quick little Google search should pull that up for you pretty quick. Uh, it looks like we have uh, another question. Uh, do you feel deer farms are a threat to our wild deer herd in Kentucky as far as disease transmission? Um, there are regulations in place uh, on the deer herds, and if they are followed, um, deer herds, uh, private deer farms are um, perfectly fine. Uh, as long as their deer have been tested and made sure they don't have any current diseases, they're not supposed to be bringing deer uh, into their farms from anywhere uh, outside the state. Um, so, uh, that with exclusion being Indiana, because it's a CWD free state, um, if that's followed, um, then there's the deer farms are not a threat because there's no, there's no potential for right. diseased deer coming in. Unfortunately, what we've seen with many of those states in that map is deer farms were the source of the disease within the state. Uh, it wasn't moving around from the wild population. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the bad actors that are unfortunately yeah. ruining things. And, and it's hard to, um, to pinpoint things. And it's, it's one of those where um, I don't want to blame the deer farmers because sure. if they're following the rules, then they're not doing anything wrong. But um, deer farms are, have been a problem in the past with other sure. states. Yeah. You can see how that could happen for sure when you get – yeah. You get, it's a very high value industry. I mean, so there's mm -hmm. those big deer um, can sell for three quarters of a million dollars or more. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of temptation, uh, unfortunately. Sure. And, you know, I don't want to bash the, the deer breeding industry uh, because there's a lot of people that do things right. And, and um, you know, and I applaud them for yeah. that and I hope they continue. Well, I think you'd find that in almost any profession, it, right? It you is. Know? Yeah, it's it's just a it's a seems to be an increased risk for disease, uh, a source of disease, which is really kind of scary to think that you know just kind of one little mistake like that could really have a big implications on yes our population here in Kentucky. Thank you for watching this previously recorded webinar. Should you have any questions about the webinar you just viewed, please email forestry 
www.forestry.extension at uky.edu. And for more information about forestry and wildlife in Kentucky, please visit us online at www.ukforestry.org. Thanks so much.